Nobody wants to get united. Like, what we gotta do is meet everybody in home 49th Street at the bench. Hey guys, welcome back to the bench. It's another beautiful, gorgeous day, and I figured we can spend the day just chilling, painting, and enjoying some letters on walls. So I figured I'd get an early start to the day, start painting really early, and currently it's 6 o'clock in the morning. Now, as you guessed, Montana did sponsor today's video. Massive shout out to them. You guys really enjoyed the last video, and they're the ones who made this possible. So if you want to restock on your supplies, I got all their information in the description down below. Montana hooked me up with a great deal of paint, and well, for the life of me, <laughs> I don't know what the fill-in color should be. So we got the outline all knocked out, and at the moment, I'm kind of trying to figure out what color it is I want to use for the fill-in. But I don't have a lot of different colors. I got blues, I got greens, I got purples, I got pink, and I think that's it. And I don't really want to use pink or purple on this kind of blue, so that leaves me with green or blue. And I'll be honest, I'm kind of partial to the blue, but we just did that. So I might go with the green. Well, we're going to end up testing that out, see how it looks. I think I'm going to end up using the 60-40 for the fill-in and see how that goes for me. You know, today's a good day. My girlfriend got me Tic Tacs. Everyone's got like, like a piecing snack. And this is definitely mine. It's a weird one, don't judge me, but believe it or not, it's not pork rinds like last video. So, as you might see, I finally decided on a fill-in color. I went ahead with the green, and the reason for that was because I was looking at my colors and I was like, man, I got a lot of greens to work with here, and I got even more blues. And the greens are all nice, different values, so it can really supply a really beautiful gradient from top to bottom. But you see, I got four different greens, and we're only using three for the actual gradient itself. And the reason for that is because I want to leave one extra green, the darkest green, for shading. And we're going to kind of do the same thing with the blues as well, but except I got a little bit more blues and I got greens. So we have a little bit more range of those values with the blues. So it should make for some really nice 3D, especially since I do have a lot of like my signature 3D extensions on this, so it should be pretty fun. Also, can't really see it too well right here, but I'm working on a little bit of a like character face there. It's not the first time I do characters on walls, but I'm excited to see how it comes out. I, I don't have a lot of different colors, so don't expect human skin on that girl because, well, that's just not gonna happen. She's gonna, she's gonna be a weird color like pink or something. I really didn't come into this with a plan though, I'll be honest. I don't know the fill-in. I don't have any ideas for interior detail. I didn't come planned with, you know, any sort of outline nothing I'm kind of just winging it having a good time and once again you know just enjoying the day painting and I think you can kind of even see some of that like unsureness if that's even a word with the piece because there are a couple of sloppy areas but there is a method to the madness and we'll get into that a little bit later I don't know what it is about Montana paint, but it seems like bees really like it. <laughs> because as I'm painting, dude, so many bees are like flying right around where I painted. It's it's weird. I mean, it's it's strange. But check it out. Really, what I wanted to go ahead and show you guys was a little bit of a um, a peek into what I was thinking when I was working on these letters. I know it's something you guys wanted from the other video where you guys had mentioned that you wanted to see me kind of delve a little bit deeper into my thoughts as I was working. So check it out. For the G currently right here, we actually have like two different letter structures happening at once. So we have the first G right here. It's actually just one G, but two different kind of segments. So you have the rounded lowercase portion of the G that comes downward here and then swings up. You can see that open counter right here. Now, granted, I did connect it in this area right there, so it's not really all that open, but it otherwise would have been. And then we have the more angular portion down here. So it's like two different parts of a lowercase g. But if it's one thing I really like doing in my letters, it's a lesson I actually learned from fine art, which is to have lines point to one another, have instances occur where something is directed towards. So kind of just to delve into that a little bit, so we have the leg of the R, which ends right there. And then it comes right about there where I'm gonna end up filling in. You're not gonna see any line past this point. So what I can do is I can take an extension of the G from over here, shoot it down, and make sure it lines up perfectly to where the R would have been. And that's why we see this kind of like dusty line right here, because this is gonna get erased, but it points to the extension of the G. Doing this sort of thing in your pieces can really help raise flow, and it also makes things seem more organic, as if it's supposed to be there, as if it serves some kind of purpose. And there's many different ways to do this. You don't have to do it with just extensions, you can do it with letters as well, and I'm doing it throughout this entire 
entire piece here, except for the bottom of the piece. Let's ignore that because I kind of sort of messed up down there a bunch, as you can tell. So someone in a previous video of mine asked, is it easier or better to go ahead and like do your line by looking at where your hand is or looking at where you're trying to go? And I feel like it's very similar to any other medium, whether you're using brush pens, whether you're using markers, whether you're using oil paints or whatever the case is, I feel like it's really helpful to look at both, right? Look at where you're going, that way your hand and eye coordination can take control. But look at where you are, that way you can make sure you're still on the right track. Kind of glancing every now and again at where you are, but focusing more so on where you're going. We got our mixing ruler again, which has lots of cardboard on it. But I want to talk to you guys a little bit more about what we spoke about before, about flow. And I tried it over here with this part of the end, this little extension that comes down. Initially, I had it swing forward and I was going to do something similar to this part, but on this side. And I realized I ran out of room, so I wasn't able to do that. And as a result, I had to shoot it down this way. Once again, making sure to align this with this. Now, granted, this ends up happening simply just because they are the same part of the same, you know, extension. So it's not as suggestive as we first showed on the other side. We also have this done here on the M, right over here, where the M comes down, stops, and then it shoots down to the compressed extension of the RI, where the RI has this little bit that comes down. Once I outline it, you'll be able to see it much better. We also have other little things like letter uniformity and similarity, which you'll see later in the piece at the top of the GR combination and the right hand side of the M. They both are kind of the same with this dip down and then a dip back upwards. So little things like that help in order to go ahead and bring everything back together. So how do we get smooth gradients like that right there and this down here. Granted, they still need a little bit of work, they're not 100% done, but since I'm in the process of doing it, we we'll figured I'd go ahead and show you guys on a different part of the piece right over here where it's a lot less smooth. So this is really, really simple and not hard at all. I'll walk you through it. For this, we got my 6050, my darkest dark, and my 6040, the one that's right up here. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna take a reasonably not skinny cap and we're gonna go from a pretty decent distance and we're just gonna go ahead and mist it on there like that. All we're trying to do is we're trying to break up this solid line and make it a lot fuzzier. That's all we're trying to do. And notice how I'm tilting the can in this direction because this is the darkest dark, so we're putting it on the dark side and we're spraying up. That way this, the paint kind of fades away as it goes further away. From here, you can take your other paint and do the same exact thing and just repeat the process until you get the kind of look you want. Gotta end up getting one of those uh, one of those GoPros. Used to have one, lost in Puerto Rico. Uh, <laughs> I was trying, I was trying to, uh, this is completely irrelevant, but I was trying to go ahead and record like some underwater shot just to test out like the waterproofing of the thing and a wave, boom, nailed the camera and whoosh, there it was, gone into the sea forever along with like roses, Rose's boyfriend, who's also lost at sea, because she let him go. Anyway, <laughs> about the graffiti, I don't know what that rant was. We finally put in the interior details. So what I did was I had like the three green gradient colors, right? The light green, the medium green, and the dark green. And I decided to pull each green into one of the other greens. So the light green would go into the medium green from time to time and do some interior details, whether it's bubbles or chips. And the medium green would go into both the light and the dark green, and the dark green would go into the medium green. Now, I didn't really go ahead and finish every Everything up because as you can see the 3d still needs to go ahead and get filled in and shaded so some of that blue is gonna end up getting into the green so I'm leaving all of the cleaning up until after the 3d is done it's just the order I like to do things in I know other graffiti artists like to do things a little bit differently but I like to go ahead and hold off on my fill in until after my 3d is a little bit more established so I want to explain to you guys why it is I kind of work in the order that I work in and I might even tweak this a little bit because I want it to be a little bit more similar to how I oil paint where I start with the stuff in the furthest back and then I work my way forward to to me, this seems to make the most sense for graffiti just because if you want to go ahead and do your cast shadows or your drop shadow, then you can do that and you don't have to worry about cutting lines back because when you do your piece on top of that, you can just go right into your 3D and start cutting the lines on your first go. The same thing kind of goes with the fill-in, which I tend to do my fill-in first just to kind of get a feel for the letters and get a feel for where things are going to go. And that's why I like to color things in in the fill-in before doing the 3D. But I think as I get more comfortable with the process again, because as you guys know, it's been a little bit since I've been on walls consistently. So as I get back comfortable to where I used to be, I think I'll probably go with the cast shadow 3D than the fill-in. And you know, it's funny because during the process of this piece, I, it kind of threw me back to when I used to work at the shop. And I was talking to Demer one time, my partner in graffiti was sitting beside me and 
I had told my partner in graffiti, dude, man, I can't wait until the day where I can do graffiti the way I do fine art. Once again, similar to how I used to oil paint, but as it currently stands, I'm still working my way up the totem pole to do graffiti as hyper-realistically with cans as I could with oil paints or any other medium that I'm comfortable with. All right, we're back indoors, we're back at the studio, and the piece is pretty much done at this point. But before we go ahead and check it out, I want you guys to leave your tag name in the comments down below. Why, you ask? Well, I'm looking for a way in order to go ahead and save some of this paint, that way we don't burn through it too fast. So I want to go ahead and do your guys' names on walls in like basic straight letters, really simplistic stuff, nothing too, too crazy, and this will let me not only save paint, but it'll allow me a way in order to give thanks back to you guys for all you've done for me over the years. All right, let's see how the piece came out. And hopefully you guys enjoyed the piece. If you did, be sure to give the video a massive like. It lets me know you want more of this sort of content. It lets me know you want more pieces on walls. And we can't possibly wrap this video up without giving a massive thank you to Montana. They're the ones who made this video possible, and I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity. So if you guys are in need of more paint, then feel free to check out all their information in the description down below. But with all that said, subscribe if you're new here, and check these videos out if you want some more graffiti content. As always, I want to thank you guys for watching. I'll catch you guys next week, but until then, peace.